we're back. Welcome to Abstractable. This is a podcast for the entrepreneurial spirited and the curious amongst us. In the podcast, we distill the ideas from the world's best thinkers in business, startups, psychology, the arts, history, politics, you name it. And in today's episode, we will be talking about the book Deep Work by Kel Newport. And we discuss a few core things to this idea of deep work. So we talk about what the key rules are or the four key rules are to multiply your productivity exponentially through deep work. Talk about the science behind it and how to positively impact your brain from it. We also talk about the future of work, art, organizations and what they might hold in store. So why? Why is this important? Because true deep work is becoming a lost art, but at the same time becoming increasingly valuable. And because it's not just good for your work, but it's also great for your health. As always, don't forget, you can check out full video from these episodes on YouTube and check out our website, abstractable.co. And of course, if you love the podcast or enjoyed today's episode, please uh, share it with someone else. We would really appreciate it. I'm interested. I've been quite fascinated by Kanye because like, uh, I'm a fan of his music. I loved when he first came on the scene and I was very interested by his journey through his own mind that you could kind of feel throughout like as he started releasing these different albums, which I think kind of peaked around when he released Yeezus, which was such a hard-hitting album that was just like completely brilliant but shocking as well, like... um, and kind of after that, he's around that time, his mother died either before or after, and things fell apart for him. Um, so I've been kind of very interested by like what what's going on with this guy because he's like both obviously got some mental health challenges, but then don't we all? <laughs> he <laughs> yeah. Um, but is he like bipolar or not? Is he like what the tabloids say? Is he being pigeonholed? And I was kind of excited to see this long form interview with him and Joe Rogan because you kind of you knew that Joe was just going to kind of let him speak and guide the conversation. Uh, and I haven't quite finished it, but a couple of things that I picked up: very, very, very intelligent person. First of all, mm-hmm. very cogent, very knows a lot of facts, a lot of um, sort of different bits of information. He obviously reads very broadly or consumes information somehow. He also has a lot of Um, advisors, mate. That was um, what I took away too. He has obviously being on the platform that he has, he has a lot of people that he can just talk to or ask. He He could go to the, you know, the CEO of a company or this politician over here or this, you know, researcher at this university and just say, hey, I'm Kanye, Um, can you help me out? (laughs) Yeah. He he also seems to have um, very observant. So this is something that was, that's kind of, I'm reading the Warhol biography and people always said that about him is he would be the most observant person around. He's also able to connect a lot of dots between different things. So he's able to connect very abstract concepts to one another. So his mental network is very strong and the way his brain works is very different um, to the way perhaps I think or, um, or he's got a better version of that that kind of lets him pull everything together. Where he seems to be struggle, he's got uh, a bit of a God complex. He thinks that he's a, you know, he thinks that he's um, sort of, he's a narcissist effectively. He's the hand of God is what he thinks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And look, to be fair, it's probably his life's played out pretty well in most respects to kind of prove his own philosophy to himself. I mean, he's been very successful. But 
he certainly seems to think that he's kind of the um, the kind of person, the man to fix everything. Um, but he, which he's then extrapolated out to think that he should be the president. But to me, like that doesn't necessarily. I kind of was feeling like when I was listening to it, don't do that. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep looking into these farming things. Keep doing these other crazy ideas that you're coming up with um, and let's see what happens. Like, you know, maybe nothing, but I'd rather him do that because something cool might come out of that. Um, And then lastly, I think he's also got a streak of what I could pick up was paranoia. Mm. There seemed to be a lot of talk around about like, oh, there's this invisible hand that's kind of causing these issues in the music industry, but then these other issues elsewhere and like there's kind of this Illuminati lizard people sort of feel to it that someone's behind the scenes pulling all the strings. Yeah, he's there's a real conspiracist in him uh, mm. and that's super obvious. The, I like, I like um, you're familiar, mate, with the idea of like Occam's razor where things mm-hmm. where something just seems just so far fetched that you can basically ignore it like an outlier is just so far out that um you should assume that it is in fact an outlier or that there is no real you know or explanation that sits in reality here and i understand that there's you know there's many things that go on behind closed doors and many things that happen at, at levels of which you know majority of people never even know go on let alone uh, are privy to what's actually going on but it doesn't mean that there's an invisible hand in every single pie around the place uh, pulling these levers to to make things happen Um, the amount of coordination that that requires like coming mate coming from just our backgrounds in just project management it's hard enough to get a very, I'm going to say scoped, you know, we, we know what we're trying to build here and just to make that happen. Some of these like mm. invisible hand conspiracies, uh, I just don't see how they could possibly happen from a practical sense. Yeah. It's great to talk in, you know, in, in ideas and to hypothesize about things but actually bring Bring, taking something from idea to reality is a big leap in some of these cases. Yes. And, then, and then, so this, something- this, this leads to my big um, reservation with, with him. You know, I think, it's, I think it's great that he's got this vision to do this, but I think he, he, he's reminiscent of someone who would struggle to create a reality of some of these things particularly in the political sphere, which, um, you know, is very slow moving. It's a behemoth. He definitely shouldn't get into politics. Correct, yeah. And get eaten alive, but also it's just not the right space for his talent. Yeah, he's better off doing his own independent thing. I think he can, as you say, make much greater impact, you know, for good, which he's, he's seemingly trying to seek, uh, doing, doing it outside of the political sphere. It, it almost lends itself to being, do you just want to be president because of the power that it holds or because of the, um, you know, because of the ego boost that you get from that? So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I think, yeah, that's a tricky question to answer. I think that he is just like the guy is a creative genius. Mm, So like, I agree with that. You know, he hasn't just done it in music either. Like, and he's a turned himself into a billionaire. So this is like that thing that I think I've talked about once before, where we too easily dismiss people as just completely nuts, which he's clearly on the edge of some sort of mental health issue, you know, like his erratic behaviour, the way he talks um, and some of the stuff from 
what he's done in the past. But just to like write him off as as like a nut is missing the gold of what he's been able to do. So what is that edge? And he's flirting right on the edge of like creativity and and madness in some way. And then, or we just say someone that we don't like. Oh, they're stupid. They're dumb. George W. Bush is dumb. Donald Trump's dumb. It's like okay. There's a lot potentially wrong with those people, but then if you just write them off like that, you won't ever figure figure it out yeah. what they actually. You can't. Are. You can't. You can't single word anyone. <laughs> is is the crux of that? Yeah. No one can be single worded, and um, me saying crazy at the start is that single wording of someone. And when I say crazy, it's certainly not a mental health not from a mental health perspective, it's very much from that idealistic to pragmatic sense. And I think there's a great disconnect there that he's got. Um, I love the visionary ideas. I think the other person we spoke about like this, Lockie, was was Musk and his grand plan. And Mm. about just hearing about a grand plan like that is just so, so rare. And- But Musk's Musk's a lot more coherent, like- Yeah. He can communicate his idea much better than Kanye can. Well, and he and he can also he creates the pragmatic connections between it because he looks at things from a very much a first principles perspective rather than it's almost like a an idea that's so far out in in the distance that you don't really know where it's coming from or where it's being bubbled up from. The other one is um yeah, I think yeah. There's some parallels between those guys, though their oh, achievements so, so, and, and so, in sorry. different spheres. Sorry, mate. Um, just to jump, just to jump in. The I think the, the the key thing there is for someone like Musk, you can very much point to to a spaceship and you can articulate with your words what it is a spaceship is, for example. Whereas when there is so much lost in me speaking particular words at the moment of what is actually going on inside, you know, inside your own head. Um, I think that his head is just so far out. Um, as you say, it, it's very much on that creative genius cusp of madness, you know, line that gets crossed by, by many, by many greats um, at some point in time. Uh, that, that it's, it's, it's always going to be less coherent. It's always going to make less sense because there's so much lost in translation when you convert it from thought or idea to thought to words and then interpretation of someone else. He strikes me as someone who has gone through something quite traumatic Mm. and has had a lot of help to then come. He's a lot more self-aware of what he's saying in the interview. He's kind of like, well, I'm going off on too much of a tangent. I need to bring it back so that you can understand me sort of thing. Um, and I think that there's no doubt that in his other moments he's a he's a bit of an asshole uh, from raw reports. Um, but you can't help but feel like he could create some, he already has, but he could create some pretty amazing things. Um, what what and, I what I like, mate, is that he's yeah. not sitting on his laurels, or he's not sitting on his millions and billions mm-hmm. of dollars, and just sitting on his laurels, like, oh, well, you know, that that was great, and now I'm just gonna maybe rolling kind of, out the greatest hits, yeah, milk yeah. milk that, and you know, redo the albums from ten years ago, and maybe add a new song to the collection. I like that he's going beyond beyond that. Fearless, I so, admire that. <laughs> I don't think anyone's fearless, mate. Yeah. So hopefully that's a little bit of a different take on uh, on on the man. It's almost it's almost an episode in itself, Lockie. <laughs> well, we're already at 17 minutes, so if anyone's stuck with us, we can tell you what book we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, well, here we go. Here's the here's the usual segue. So Kanye pursued his craft in such a deep way that required him to put in the effort and the work. And today's book is highly related to how Kanye created himself in the beginning. So what are we talking about? Seamless. Seamless. Deep Work is the book by Cal Newport. 
So, well, better better breeze through this uh, bio because we are a little bit behind the schedule we wrote out, but, you know, we love a good tangent. So Cal Newport, born June 23, 1982, so reasonably young. Um, his father was a sociologist and a senior executive at Gallup, which is like a polling company. And skipping ahead, he kind of went to college and graduated in 2004 from Dartmouth and then earned a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in 2009. So smart fellow. Um, he did a two-year postdoc at MIT and then started um, during the 2011-2012 academic year as an assistant professor of computer science at Georgetown University. He earned tenure in 2016 and his current title is Provost's Distinguished Professor of Computer Science, which sounds pretty fancy. I don't even know but what that means. On, no, no, the device, so don't ask me. So, But he also had a second kind of calling along the way. And this is writing. And so, you know, he fancies himself a writer and I think it's backed up by his success in that medium. Um, So pretty much he wrote his first book, which was sold to Random House just after his junior year of college. It was called How to Win at College. That was 2005. So he started writing books about kind of how to be a good student. Dale Carnegie. Followed it up. That's very Dale Carnegie, mate. Ah, good segue. I mean, good connecting the dots. Kanye star. Um, so he followed up with how to become a straight A student the next year. And then in 2007, he started his blog called The Study Hacks Blog. And it became really popular. So it now receives over 3 million visits a year um, online, which is pretty impressive. I've never even heard of um, it, but that's, a, that's a, incredible. Yeah. So he published a number of other books. Uh, 2012, So Good They Can't Ignore You, which is about being good at your job um, and finding finding what you're good at, that sort of thing. Deep Work, which is the book we're talking about today in 2016. 2019 uh, was his uh, take on all the digital world, which is probably, I guess, uh, <laughs> kind of precursor in this book or hinted to. Uh, and it was called Digital Minimalism. And then he's got one uh, for 2020, The Time Block Planner, a daily method for deep work, which might be a good one for us to check out. And he currently lives with his wife and three sons in Tacoma Park in Maryland. Boom. Nice work, Lockie. You powered through that, mate. That's it. So, so what is deep work? Yeah. Um, so he sets out the entire book with this hypothesis about um, deep work, right? And that is, it is the, you know, the ability to perform deep work is becoming increasingly rare. At exactly the same time, it is becoming increasingly valuable in our economy. As a consequence, the few who cultivate this skill and then make it the core of their working life will thrive. Hmm. Yeah, so I guess the definition of the deep work hypothesis, if we go in a little bit deeper, um, is nice. kind of to talk about, <laughs> geez, could have done better there, sorry, team. Um, you've got in the book it's effectively about, the, you know, I guess how to kind of be really productive and do really groundbreaking stuff, I guess. Um, And he forms a couple of different ideas, one being that you can do deep work and one that you can do shallow work. Um, There's a a real, there's a real like dialectic in the book, right? So there's on one end of the scale is shallow work and the other end of the scale is deep work. And the world is pushing us more and more and more towards shallow work because there's just so many distractions and so or so many ways that we can be disengaged from that deep work whereas we need to fight for getting down the other end of the scale to the deep work um, portion to the to that end which is the highly valuable uh, 
end for not just you know the world but also for us yeah um so deep work well what does it mean well it means i guess it's defined as this professional activities performed in a state of distraction free concentration that push your cognitive capabilities to their limit these efforts create new value improve your skill and are hard to replicate and to contrast that, shallow work, well, shallow work's non-cognitively demanding logistical style tasks often performed while distracted and these efforts tend not to create much new value in the world and they are easy to replicate. How much, Lockie, how much deep work do you think you do? A lot more now than I used to. <laughs> but I would say After reading this, this is a constant. Yeah, well, it did have a big effect on me, actually, this book. Um, and I should just say that this is a very, very uh, useful concept um, and worth diving into. So I would say that my, my week is a constant battle between these two. Mm. And to do deep work is to do high leverage work i think deep work is kind of non-linear work it doesn't you don't get to tick the to-do list and say yep done created that new theory created that new xyz you know it's a it's kind of a explorative kind of work um, and it's hard it's hard to get yourself there and you need to be in a state that is fairly relaxed to do it, if you're in a high anxiety state, you're probably going to be more looking to do more shallow work, which is all those things that make you feel good. You know, you're, you're ticking stuff off the, the to-do list, but they are relatively easy tasks um, that, you know, really don't provide as much value as the deep work, but you get more short-term gratification from doing the shallow work. And secondly, if you work in an organisation in an office or something like that, um, shallow work looks like work. Does that make sense? Yeah. It looks like you're doing heaps of stuff, which can be quite good. It's a bit like um, you may say a hangover from back in the um, industrial industrial era where, where um, you know, the amount of widgets you pumped out was the value of your work. But in, in knowledge work, which is what a lot of people are involved in today, you can come up with one idea that's, uh, that's worth all the other ideas you've had combined, you know, so. Yeah, correct. The, um, there's a great question that he poses in the book, mate, which is, um, because I, I felt it quite difficult to actually discern, like, what does deep work really mean? You know, is it, is it just sitting down doing that, you know, doing a Pomodoro for 25 to 50 minutes and, you know, you've, you've done nothing but kind of do your work? No, it actually means- What's a, a Pomodoro? Have you heard of the Pomodoro technique? No. So it's a, um, well, clearly that's why you're asking the question. So- <laughs> there, I, I believe it comes from this. Um, there was these timers that were like tomatoes or tomato timers, and they were, I, I think, something used for cooking or in the kitchen um, in some way yeah, or another. Yeah, I've seen those things. You twist them, and yeah, they look like a tomato. And so, apparently, there's a sweet spot in concentration levels. You know, somewhere in that twenty-five to fifty-minute hour space. You know, before you've kind of cooked your cooked your mind that you need to take a quick break and you know rejuvenate yourself to come back in, and so the idea is that you set your length of time that you're going to do this Pomodoro for, and you complete that 25 minutes completely distraction free. So it's it's you and the work and nothing else. Mm. But obviously, the work is can be anything. You know, it just needs to be distraction free. So arguably, you could you could do the Pomodoro technique, going through your emails. Going through your emails is by no means deep work. And so I think the the question really helps out here, mate. Is how long would it take in months 
to train a, sm- a smart recent college graduate with no specialized training in my field to complete this task. So can you repeat that once more? Because this is an important point that can help people define deep work how, there every day. Yeah, so how long would it take in months to train a smart recent college graduate with no specialized training in my field to complete this task. And pretty well, if your answer is not in the vicinity of 12 plus months or years, um, you're certainly not doing deep work. And the implication there is you probably should be delegating it, I guess. Well, delegating it, or you should be batching it up with all of your other similar similar sized tasks and um, you know doing them at the same time. So there's a quote here from the book, deep work is not some nostalgic affect- affectation of writers and early 20th century philosophers. It's instead a skill that has great value today. So what's, a, what's an example of deep work that you do? I think, um, I think writing to some degree, uh, there is some levels of writing. And the reason is you can't capture your own, it's hard to capture your own voice. Um, now I'm not a prolific writer by any sense, but it's hard to, it'd be hard to replicate your own voice. So if I was actually any good at writing, um, you know, I think, uh, you could continually get better benefit from that. So like combining my own, your own voice with your, um, area of, say expertise is a great, you know, a great way to do that. Um, I think intense studying is another example uh, of, of that. And it kind of fits outside the rule, but he uses an example throughout the book where the, um, within Jewish, the Jewish culture, there is a, or Jewish practice, there's an emphasis on every single day that you are reading, you know, reading from the holy book and um, intensely studying it. And there's this real like ferocity when you when you do see people doing this. Um, mm. uh, it's quite fascinating. And you can just see, you, you know the difference between you're kind of doing like a bit of lighthearted reading or you're on a, a deadline to get something read or finished off and there's this real intensity of focus. Um that's happening and really trying to take in exactly what you've got. It's like that last, those last minute cram sessions before exams that you were meant to study for (laughs) three weeks prior. Um, I think that's an example of doing deep work in the sense of studying. But the idea is you're not doing that just because it's uh, your exams in half an hour. Yeah. So do you think an example of shallow work i guess the easiest one would be i guess you know reading and replying to emails is something that comes to mind hugely shallow work yeah um and things of the like but it makes you look busy lucky it makes you look productive in the current in the current culture of organizations and that's the problem yeah oh yeah so tell me about the, um, I suppose, the neuroscience behind this. Yeah. So the the, the real that something that's in the book. Yeah, the real this this got me quite excited, Lockie. As um as you know, I quite often do around the the health side of things, and it's actually really good, really good for you to um to actually do deep work, which is just even more incentive to try and pursue it. So I'm going to read this verbatim from the book. Um, Focusing intensely on a specific skill, you're forcing the specific relevant circuit to fire again and again in isolation. This repetitive use of a specific circuit triggers cells called oligodendrocytes to begin wrapping layers of myelin around the neurons in the circuits. So myelin is a layer of fatty tissue that grows around neurons acting like an insulator that allows the cells to fire faster and cleaner. 
people experiencing attention residue after switching tasks are likely to demonstrate poor performance on that next task. And the more intense the residue, the worse the performance. So there's a couple of things in that, right? The more that you're doing this deep work, the more you're encouraging this my, myelin. I hope I've pronounced these words right. But essentially, you're, you're, you are getting better at doing that deep work. So you're actually, you're like compounding the, your ability to do that work, which is, mm. which is so fascinating. And also by doing so deep, just- deep work, you're, you're reducing this residual that sits in your mind. That's really interesting. So do you think that that kind of says around that this is a kind of muscle to be built effectively? It's exactly what it is. And it, it actually acts like a muscle in the sense that, you know, you go to the gym and your muscles are done for the day. You know, after after doing a, a, a session at the gym, the same thing here. And we can only, we can only do, I believe, he says, between one hour and up to a kind of around a maximum of four hours of deep work each day before we're totally cooked. And four hours of deep work is, it's like people like him who are, you know, religious about their their practice of deep work and dedicate time to it and put in huge amounts of effort to make sure they've got it. Whereas I think for most people, we're sitting much closer down to the, the one hour of deep work. And that's genuine deep work. Uh, and I think that's, I think that again also helps frame up in addition to the question what this definition of deep work actually is. Like if you can do it for more than an hour a day, it's probably not deep work. Mm, interesting. That's, yeah. At least to begin with when you're yeah, when you're coming into this kind of deep work sphere. So I guess um why is it so valuable in the modern world? Well, um, as I, as we said earlier, mate, I think the the world is is a distracted place. You know, we're we've got we're connected to everyone immediately. We we're expected to respond, or there's certainly an expectation to respond immediately. Although there's movements to try and uncouple that a little bit. Um, I'm thinking of like Basecamp and and some other organisations here. Uh, so every single one of those notifications, uh, or even just the presence of having the ability to see what what is happening live, puts a pressure on us um, to you know to to have parts of our mind split away from what we're actually currently working on or doing. And effectively, you're, you're just spending your entire time multitasking so you can't filter out. And the idea is you can't filter out irrelevancy eventually, people who are habitual multitaskers and they can't manage a working memory and they're pretty much mental wrecks is what um, Cal Newport describes in the book. And so with the increasing number of people that are certainly falling in this category, you know, m- me included, it's – there's less and less people doing deep work. Yeah. I think that's that's very true is that it, the world is tending us towards doing less and less of this. But at the same time, the world is also kind of now you can use leverage a lot more easily, which is something we've talked about in other programs. So, um by doing the deep work and if you hit hit the jackpot with something or even if you don't and you're just doing this, there's a few, no one else is, people who can do it um, are going to find breakthroughs that they can scale quickly and it become more valuable because of the increased power laws in our society, uh, power law effects. Um, for example, something like... Um, if you're 10 times better at some than someone else because of all the deep work you've done at being a graphic designer, you're going to win all the work on 99 designs um, that comes through from all over the, the globe, you know. It's not just the people from your town that want that. It's now 
you're now competing with a lot of others. And so there can be more winner take all effects. And then, so I guess those two things combined, um, no one's doing it and it's more valuable for those that can do it, um, are a, a pretty, uh, a pretty compelling reason to kind of get involved in this, right? Yeah. The, the, the quote, I love this in the book. He uses this example of singers. So hearing a succession of mediocre singers does not add up to a single outstanding performance. So we're not going to go to the, to a concert hall to see 50 average singers perform. We're going to, we're going to go to the concert hall to see one incredible singer perform. Mm. And so these things, these things don't accumulate, like the mediocre doesn't accumulate. And so I think if you frame this from a organization's perspective, um, it places even <laughs> it places even greater emphasis on trying to get the best talent that you possibly can. Absolutely. <laughs> so everyone can do this, right? <laughs> yeah, well, they can, right? This feels like an interview. <laughs> it's not a superpower. It's like a, uh, it, it's something that's like, we can all work on, I guess, which is kind of very something else I quite liked about the book is that it it kind of gave you that um, I don't know feeling that hey, this is something I can access straight away and build on. Yeah, it's like just like going to the gym, mate. It's the muscle, and so <laughs> the same as going to the gym, you need to. There's like that mental effort to say I am going to go to the gym. And I am going to do this exercise, and, and having that discipline, I guess, um, you know, to to take that cliche, discipline equals freedom to some degree. And so it's the same thing. It's it's like training a muscle. Um, we do have the amount of the limit for how much deep work we can do in a day, as I already said. Um, it, it, yeah, it's it really comes under this this um, similar thing we've spoken about in the past around creativity in, in the many creativity episodes we've done now, mate, is that whole artists or innovators fallacy. You know that there's just these big sparks of inspiration that happen for these creative geniuses, um, all these great inventors of, of bygone, you know, of history. But it's not the case. And there's a quote that's, Great creative minds think like artists, but work like accountants, and that's by David Brooks. And I think I think we just see this repeated so so much. Uh, it's just about putting in um, some effort to do it. The the other the the catch is right is it's it's a long term, it's a longer term payoff. It's not. I I don't. Because of the type of work that you're doing, I I wonder um, I wonder if you could have short term payoffs from deep work. You know, if you start tomorrow, are you going to see a return from that deep work that you've done? I I, I t tend to doubt it because if you're no, just starting out with the yeah, um, you need to like kind of burrow to the burrow to the depths or the, the frontiers of of knowledge or the frontiers of you know your craft or the frontiers of your creative genius or muse to to find what is at the frontier and then you start to discover new things from that uh, that that deep work path this is where we see yeah. jazz musicians go on wild tangents mate <laughs> yeah yeah, when Coltrane locks himself upstairs for, you know, five weeks to write an album or something. <laughs> um, I mean, there's other things about this too that even if you don't sit down and create your greatest masterpiece, just the practice of blocking out distractions, which is kind of like deep work light 
almost. That's enough to have a huge impact on your, um, I suppose, yeah, I guess your work life, you know, and your productivity. Yeah. I've, uh, there's like a, I've got like a vague, a vague rule for myself. If I'm, if I'm able to even remotely do something else like uh, that, that has potential distraction in it, I'm not, I'm not in deep work. And so I think even for myself, highly lyrical music, I can't even listen to highly lyrical music and really mm. maybe even not listen to music at all because it can become distracting. Even, even like that real study music can potentially be distracting. Um, I know people uh, like emphasize how important music is for them to be able to do be productive and, and get some work done. But I think there's like another layer uh, that particularly when you're dealing in the creative realms that that music becomes a distraction for you. I'm not sure if you have a similar thing. Do you listen to music, mate, when you work at all? Uh, sometimes. So it kind of depends what I'm doing. Um, but I find if I really need to concentrate on something, I'll put some music on usually like like you say with not many lyrics because it kind of calms me down and stops me thinking about other things it kind of mm-hmm. clears my mind a bit it's probably the value of it but if i'm in a space like i find i do good deep work tasks and creative strategy kind of work best like later in the day because i know most of the problems of the day are are dealt with and so a, a major impediment for me for getting in that deep work space is my own mind <laughs> and calming it down enough and stopping thinking about other things to be um, in a space that's able to do that kind of deep thinking creative work. That's really fascinating, Matt. Um, I know you do a bit of writing. Do you think you could write, you know, some of some of the stuff you write if you were listening to, or certainly if you're listening to like an album with a you know a singer songwriter or something like that, you couldn't you couldn't write a piece listening to that. No, no, no. I, I don't listen to music when I'm writing. Yeah. And interestingly, I I found that I'm most I'm better at writing first thing in the morning. Mm. So it's kind of like it's a little bit depending what I'm doing. I have different tactics. If I'm doing like a bit of like strategy work or wanting to think quite creatively, I'll stand up. I've got this weird technique of whiteboarding things. Like, so I'll make sure I'm standing up. I've got music going. I'll make sure I'm moving around quite a lot. Might even dance a little bit. (laughs) And then I'll draw things on the board. And if they don't look right in a certain color, I'll change the color. And just make sure I'm kind of like feeling what I'm putting up there. It's kind of like this real I love interesting this, I love thing this. I've developed. Um, these these so sound like these sound like about the colors. Um, these sound like Lockie's yeah. some of Lockie's rules for you know brainstorming. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it is. It's like uh, some weird rules for brainstorming. You know, that's that works for me. Kind of gets you in that kind of. I don't know, making connections that helps me make connections between things. Right, um, a lot, a lot of what then, you're saying resonates with our physiology. Like it's we, right. yeah, the chemicals, the chemicals are playing out right in our brains and within our bodies in the afternoons to do that creative brainstorming. In the mornings, we've got the most energy, so we can put the work into the the more deep work. There's more of that that. Um, that quota that's left for the day. There's more of that mu- muscle that can be flexed. So everything you're saying aligns with the actual research and you know, let's say the science behind behind it, which is great. You're not you're another like you know tick on the empirical case study, the great empirical case study of um, of productivity. Good to hear. Um, yeah, well, that's that's quite interesting. Um, because 
Yeah, it does depend on the type of work you're doing, how you kind of get yourself into that headspace, I think. Um, I've sort of like used deep work strategies to my, to and mindset to like also do things that I think are high leverage, even if they're not technically deep work. So like making sure I've turned off distractions and stuff like that, but I'm I'm also trying to think about um, things that may not classify quite as Cal's full definition of like thinking really hard about a problem or trying to solve a theory in his instance, but like making a phone call to someone important and taking the time to have a good chat to them is not really deep work, but it might be very high leverage depending on what you're, what you're doing. Um, and so prioritizing that and, and not, um, and being intentional about putting that first instead of receiving and replying to pointless emails or whatever um, is um, kind of fits in this sphere, I think. There's almost like a, I think that's really great, mate. There's, you're placing like a greater importance on the, the quality of that connection rather than the quantity of, the, you know, you could, you could flick off 16 different emails uh, or you could just make one more meaningful phone call or one you know, meaningful proper interaction with, with someone in that sense. And not only are you going to probably get a better outcome because you don't have the lost, all the stuff lost in translation that you get when going from voice to text, um, but you, you, um, you've developed the relationship with that person even further. Yeah, I think, you know, something that struck me a lot in this book is just, you know, we're really, we are fighting a war against distraction, each of us, you know, and I reckon I'm losing that war, you know, um. I reckon most if of I get up in the morning, the first thing, yeah, the first thing I'm doing is checking my phone. You know, I'm. I've even found myself recently slipping on my rules around not checking emails after six o'clock, not doing, putting my phone in the bedroom, those kind of things. Um, not checking Slack. I, I now find myself slipping on those things, and when I know I'm doing those things, I'm usually more anxious and it just feeds that anxiety and keeps that circle going and then I'm less likely to do the deep work the next day um, because there's something about going into the deep work that I feel a bit guilty about because it's not the type of work I've been taught all my professional life is valuable yeah there's that there's that there's that uncoupling that needs to happen between looking busy and actually being productive because it's it, particularly from you know the industries that we come from mate you know it's the it's prolific the the faster you run around mm. and talk to many different people and send a thousand emails around it's just it makes you look like you're doing all this great work when in fact you you're not doing much at all. Um, there is, yes, there is like a coordination thing that needs to go on. Uh, I appreciate that. But the there is not much deep work actually happening uh, in that sense. And and that's where he's really trying to, you know, Newport's trying to, trying to get people. Right. So is there some rules that we can so kind we, of abide by? Yeah, I was just thinking that. Like let's jump into the, the four rules of deep work. Oh, Rule mate, we're one. on the same page. Look at that. God, how do we do it? It's almost like we've got a sheet that we're working to <laughs> that someone's written down and discussed before recording the episode. Um, but don't worry, it's not overly scripted, this. If you haven't been able to tell already that we just talk whatever comes to our mind. So, Well, if we, if um, we, if we had timestamps on our show, Lockie, we, um, we blew that out of the water at the start with our Kanye conversation. Uh, indeed we did, but I enjoyed it. So rule one, work deeply. He's just switched the words of the title and added Lee at the end of deep. So... What he means is 
actually do this stuff and practice it and build that muscle. So make deep work a state of mind and do it repeatedly. Prioritize it and make sure you do it every day. Make it a habit. You know, you know what's the big one for me in this one, mate, is... Tell me. Um, we place a gr- we're placing an increasing importance on time and I think – and the lack thereof, you know, have, we seemingly have less time in this, you know, in this connected, connected world in which we live. And so if you, if you recognize that, um, I, think, I think people are also be, becoming more in touch with the, the limited amount of time that we have. Um, or at least, you know, maybe that's just what I'm, I'm soaking up. I don't know. And so as a result, because you only get somewhere in the vicinity of one to four hours of this deep work a day, if you don't spend a day and then you need to have a sleep, you know, before you can recharge the batteries, if you don't spend a day doing that deep work, you've effectively lost a day in your life that you could have spent doing some deep work and then the obvious, you know, compounding benefits from that. And yeah. and, and that just feels like a, a deep loss, you know, to some degree. I understand there, there needs to be rest, there needs to be days of relaxation, but to um, – and doing whatever. And <laughs> Well, the point is that most of it's not spent relaxing that you're not doing the deep work. The, the actual opposite is true is that if you prioritise this and re- removing distractions and the like, you will get your work done more quickly, more effectively. You'll be better at it. So you'll have more free time. Um, and that's one of the things that he sort of said is he's produced a huge amount of academic literature for his short career and achieved tenure quite young. But he only works eight hours a day, yeah. which is which is yeah for people that aren't in the kind of academic circle, people are working like twenty hours a day trying to get to <laughs> yeah trying to get their tenure and stuff. So he's a uh, he's you know, yes he's an incredibly smart guy, but he he was not able to perform at the same level. He's he's working half the amount of time and he's producing double the amount of papers um, or or whatever. Now, maybe that's not a great measure um, from from our man who hasn't had to mention this episode, but the – I'm not even going to mention his name. But He um, who shall not be named. <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's still a sign of – of, of a definite increase in productivity but it's there's that hurdle of one caring less about what other people think and you know he talks about getting permission from your boss for example and you need to frame that in a very uh careful way it's like hey how much time or how, what is my shallow work budget how much time do you should i dedicate to shallow work in a day and and your boss will go, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> None. I want you to just be doing deep work. He will say, well, this is what deep work is, you know. Um, and I think I think that's a nice way to help frame it up, particularly if you are in an organisation. And I think, sadly, some some industries just aren't there yet. But we uh, hopefully can start to shift shift the boat. Um, or shift the boat within your organisation. I, I don't know. It's might be harder said than done, mate. Have you got any any like personal reflections on on how someone approaching you would you how you would respond to that? I mean, I'd love it. Mm. Um, That's because you've read this book, <laughs> and I. Th- but I think it also shows that you're intentional about your work. Um, if you can explain why, I mean, I can't see why anyone would object to that Uh, as long as it's reasonable um i think the why is the important thing is that you've got to explain your reasoning and what it's going to do for the team as a whole Um, that would be the best way to communicate it yeah i um i i think the hurdle would be uh that pressure the social pressure 
uh, around you about everyone else looking busy. So getting over that and then realizing the, the, the longer term payoff time required. But once you've, yeah. once you've gotten over the hump, I think the, uh, it'll just kind of compound on itself the benefits that the return. Absolutely. Something else that I was in that kind of struck me when you were talking about like how we have less time now, it can be framed another way too is that life's faster. <laughs> so that's been proven like in, in bigger cities, people walk faster, move faster than in slow, smaller cities uh, and then again slower in slower towns. So life is faster. The connections are faster. You can contact 50 people instead of writing out a few letters, you know, um, in the same amount of time. So connections increase. You can, so you can, can also create... contact you can also contact millions of people, mate, in one in one foul swoop. True, but that that doesn't necessarily that is true, but it's not probably the normal for most people. Mm. The normal now is that you just can email a bunch of people, you know. Um, so what, what that does feel like is it, it creates a feeling of scarcity of time um, because you are always running around and I feel like this a lot, you know. Um, but that's somewhat of an illusion too. Mm. It's, it's like falsely propped up. Um, it's that illusion of productivity again that we've spoken about and... Mm the uh, if there was a way to measure value your gauge would be sitting down down at the lower end of the scale when you're acting in that way it'd be great to have like a gauge just sitting there you'd be like oh shit i need to i need to actually speed up a bit um on my gauge cool idea you know maybe we'll have that soon we might have like the you know the the new google glass version or you know Elon Musk might bring out a, a gla- some sort of thing that's embedded in the eye that we've got a little dashboard sitting there. We'll turn into Terminators. God. So, rule two. So, just because of the that was that, tangent, was, that, was, just that was one rule. <laughs> just because of the tangent, rule one is work deeply. <laughs> um, rule two is embrace boredom. Now, this is a very interesting concept. That he comes up with here. This, uh, this is my favorite um, of of all, of all these rules, mate. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So intense concentration needs to be balanced with times of doing nothing. So this lets you notice what's coming up in your mind and gives your brain a rest. So slow down and let yourself think. So give yourself time where you don't do anything. You're, you're quite um, good at going for walks to like clear the mind, aren't you, mate? I do walks, yeah. I try and do them during the day sometimes if I'm lucky enough. Um, but certainly if I'm trying to figure something out, I'll like to go for a walk. If I'm going to have a meeting where we're supposed to be talking about something I actually like to do difficult conversations on walks too, but I think that doing sort of strategy stuff during a walk or after a walk or something is also quite kind of works. Yeah. the Because I think part of the reason why things feel faster and why we've got less time it, I'm going to use an analogy here, right? Is in in building a in building a company, it's just important to, and I'm talking about growth here. It's just as important to reduce churn as it is to actually grow the customer base. So if you have a one percent increase in your overall customers and a one percent decrease in your churn, they're f- pretty close to being the same the same thing. Right, mm-hmm. um, they're both big impacts, and so what I think has actually happened is we've just filled in all of our other time with these distractions. So as soon as we finish 
you know, a batch of emails or a bunch of phone calls rather than having that maybe calm walk back to our desk or that calm walk back to the office somewhere. We're on our phone. We're connected into the emails. We've re- refreshed everything. We've jumped on the automatically somehow ended up on Instagram. And you're like, hey, how did I end up scrolling through Instagram uh, on my way back to the desk? And that's, I think that's just as big of a problem as it is the fact that we've lost some of that deep work. Yeah. And the, the, the kind of creativity that comes out of those moments is, in, is incredible when you actually do them. I don't know. I feel like I, I, I just have this ability to solve, solve problems so much better when I, again, have to be disciplined with it but dedicate those times. Yeah, and don't, don't expect anything out of it is probably the mm. other thing mm. that he points out is that it's not to solve anything in particular. It's just to give your brain time to kind of process everything. Uh, I think that's kind of what he's getting at there too. Um, rule three, he goes straight for the jugular. Uh, rule three, quit social media. So quit the distraction machine. It ain't worth it. Have you quit social media, Lockie? For I'm not too bad. I get on Reddit. Oh. I like that. Okay. But I'm off Instagram and Facebook and those ones and Twitter. I don't look at them anymore. I was quite into Instagram earlier in the year, but I've just kind of tried to stop doing that. Um. But I'm certainly not perfect. I'll, I've even started over the last, since COVID's been like peaked and, and the American election I've gotten quite interested in, I've even started checking the news. That's my new social media is I'm looking at the news again, which I want to make sure I stop doing because I've, I don't like it, but it's somewhat addictive as well. So... That's my social media. I think is at the moment. I'm, I'm, I've been particularly at the getting towards the end of the Melbourne lockdown. I started reading the news a lot again, and it's made my life worse. So I need to stop doing it. I, I love that. Yeah, <laughs> reading the news made my life worse. It's a, it's a nice little quote there. I'm, yeah, I'm. I need to reduce my intake as well mate i don't i don't use facebook uh i do have a i do check linkedin every day like i don't go through the news feeds but i check what's happening and notifications that type of stuff Mm -hmm. uh i do the same on instagram although instagram sucks me in a little bit more with with you know watching a couple of stories or something um and yeah, I might I might check Twitter, but I would I'd love to get to the place of just not feeling obliged to check any of it. Uh, and you know, I, to be honest, I think that the way to do that to fast track that is just to delete the apps um, or deactivate your account is the uh, <laughs> the yeah. next level on top. That's true. Uh, yeah, I think like my addiction to my phone is still really bad you know even if i don't jump on instagram i'm still on my phone non-stop you know? uh, yeah i'd love to improve that i find that i find that in recent years my s- social media use has been replaced you know so I, ha- I have a limit of like half an hour a day but my email and slack usage has gone right up uh, yeah. So it's almost been yeah the void has been replaced. So I haven't actually got any anything back probably. The last um, the last one, rule four: drain the shallows. So a couple of points here. It's really about kind of batching all your shallow tasks together. So doing all your shallow tasks in one hit, and then separating them out from the deep tasks. Saying no to things, so say no to stuff that 
is shallow and you don't need to do it or is not important. Sometimes I'll say yes to those tasks because I just want to feel busy. Um, but the absolute biggest benefit that I've found out of reading this book is to turn off all notifications. So I turned off all my notifications except for my calendar. Uh, and it made a huge impact not only on my mood but on my productivity. Uh, massive difference. Yeah, I, I've done the same. Mate. The Not having any red badges on your home screen is it, – it's undescribable the difference it makes when you go from having red badges everywhere to – or to, to none. There's no there's no obligation. There's, and there's none of, nothing popping up. Um, the only app that I've I think I've got that on now is like phone, phone. Like if someone rings me. Yeah. Um, and typically, if someone's ringing you, there's there's probably a little bit more importance. I feel uh, about yeah. the I've about text, the situation. Text messages. I have that as well. Uh huh. Yeah. So. And I think I think that's that's critical. And uh, again, this this question of of deep work pops up again, mate. It's just always reminding yourself, like in this in this work that I'm doing, if I haven't done the deep work that day, how long is it going to take to train a smart recent college graduate to do what I'm doing? And you know, yeah. you want to be aiming towards those higher ends, higher end of the scale there. Yeah, and sometimes I think that. I'm using these things or coming home and jumping on my phone at every moment between if I stop watching TV, I'm on my, I jump on my phone. If I stop on my phone, I'll turn on the TV or something. That that constant need for distractions often masking some sort of negative emotion or feeling that I'm having, usually around just being anxious about something. And then if I took the time just to, kind of deal with that for a few moments I'd feel a lot better <laughs> um, and that can often happen if I'm overworked and overtired and it's often characterized for me by a feeling of not actually realizing sorry I have to f say this the right way but it's kind of characterized for me by feeling like I absolutely don't want to slow down is usually when I most need to. Yeah, so I always I'll love have that. A, aversion to it. Yeah, it's like if you if you, it's it's almost like a great, yeah, litmus test. If I feel like I don't want to slow down, then then the red flag should go up. I like that, Lockie. I really like that as a rule because if you're in deep work, you're not even going to be thinking about slowing down or speeding up. They, they won't even come into your mind. Um, you'll just be doing. And so if you're having this thought, that's almost becomes a great trigger point because particularly in like mindfulness practice and you know being present, it helps to have reminders throughout the day. They quite often talk about anchoring, you know, this anchoring particular parts of, behavior or your day to, to things and i think that's a great anchor is the is this flag of i don't want to slow down therefore i need to slow down and stop yeah i i agree yeah i think that because deep work is often in my mind closely associated with a like calm mind and shallow work is associated with like a fight or flight sort of state, you know, you it's kinetic. It's kind of you're moving around, you're solving this, you're moving that, you're calling this person, you're texting that back, you know. You're in this kind of hyped up state of task, task completion mm. and you need to, I find that I need to slow myself down a lot to get into that really effective deep work space. Yes. There's, there's something that, at the outset doesn't feel as good about doing deep work. It feels like it's that no. discipline. It's that putting on the sneakers to get out the door and go for the run, which I hate doing, by the way. Um, or yes. it's, you know, going to the gym. It's, it's the exact same thing. But as soon as you're in the mix and as soon as you're out the other side, it's a it's hundred times better than 
um, you know, if you came out of the mix on the uh, doing the, all the, the smaller short-term tasks. In fact, you typically feel ruined after you come out the other side of uh, doing all the other short-term <laughs> small tasks. So, yeah. Um, mate, what does the future hold? What, what's going on? Where's the world heading now? We, we said that there's been this big dialectic between the two, you know, pulling pulling forces, uh, one, where we need to go and two, where we're being dragged into. What's going to happen to the world? I mean, that's a tough question. I think we've got like three kind of themes we've identified. The, the hive that, that, that deep work is only going to get more valuable as time goes on that because of the distractions in the world we are less um, we are kind of getting pulled away from deep work Um, and I guess the third is that excuse me um, well I guess the third is kind of something we haven't discussed as much is that maybe this isn't quite the third, but it's a point I want to make, is that the less you do the deep work, the less you're able to do it into the future. So just like it's like, yes, it's building a muscle, but if you don't do it and you're constantly distracted, the muscle atrophies. So it's not enough just to like think about doing it. You you lose it if you don't use it. You know. Correct, Mark. So those things are, I guess, what's kind of happening. It's really important, but we're doing less of it and we're living in a super distracted world. And the less we do, the less we're able to do it. Well, the internet's connecting everything. So I guess, and we're coming into this age of automation. So I suppose one thing that you could say is that the shallow tasks are going to get eaten up by robots first. <laughs> it sounds a bit a bit or, scary, mate, but they're not actually robots like in um, what's it called? iRobot? The one with Will yeah. Smith. They're not those things yeah, walking yeah. around. They're they're hidden. They're inside the yeah. uh, the computers. They're inside as uh, little bits within you can um, within the machines of the world doing these things. Yeah, or much like given the quality of the connected uh, connection with the internet and stuff now is that the labor market's getting connected. So knowledge, shallow tasks that used to be done by knowledge workers can now be outsourced overseas um, in the same way that manufacturing jobs were from the first world to the third world countries previously. So again, if you're just a person who does shallow work only, you're in a less defensible position. So that could be one way that the world is going to change and then affect this kind of um, this kind of two types of work. Mm. Uh, I think the important thing to bring into that discussion, mate, is we've spoken about being able to solve bigger problems or being able to see through complexity when you're doing this deep work because you're playing it at such a deeper level. And this is why, you know, we start to lose, again, bring up the jazz musicians. We start to lose grasp of some of these, some of the later work as more prolific jazz musicians move, move beyond. And it's just everyone, um, you know, I'm thinking like even here, like Miles Davis moving into Bitches Brew and then into his electronic space and all this other stuff. And a lot of people came offside with him uh, there but he's playing in a different level and he's playing to, to, to people that are seeing on a, on a, in a different sphere. And I think the same thing applies here in the sense that you're playing in a different space. And so if you're playing in a different space, the, the thing we haven't kind of hit on here is that technology provides a leverage for whatever it is that you're able to do. And so if you're playing deep, in the in the depths around um, around your area of craft or your area of expertise, and you've got this leverage from from the machines, you are going to 
like the impact as a result of that is just going to be so huge. Um, yeah, that you're going to be able to achieve yeah. things at a much greater level. It's like it's like you're going to be like well, an old yeah. Egyptian pharaoh again, having six thousand you know six thousand <laughs> slaves to build the pyramids. Um, but whatever it is that that creative vision is, or whatever it is that that, that vision is to for what you want to do. And I think that's where we'll see things shift and are shifting already. Yeah, if you become truly excellent at what you do, you're going to find your market out there because you're so much more connected. Um, And there's just never been a better time to be really bloody good at something, I don't reckon, Um, because the... Yeah, it's crowded market, so that's a, that's an issue. But at the same time, you, you're going to get a chance to show your wares, you know, which often in the past people were just blocked from doing it all. Yeah. So, so some questions here, or a, a question here, Loggy. Um, oh, the other the other one we didn't touch on uh, was let capital so obviously people with with money is, uh, are going to continue to be able to amplify all this stuff again you know so they will be able to find the yeah. best talent or the masters of their craft and they'll be able to afford the best technologies to leverage that craft um and we see that Nothing as changes. the big the big tech startups and so are you familiar mate with the the term fang no so Fang in the in the tech space, particularly like the software development space, is is a term for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Right. And Fang is like it's like getting into the Olympics. So getting a job at Fang is is like you know seen right. as this high calling. It's like this um, big ambition for the. It's like trying to get into I don't know trying to get Harvard. into an I, Harvard. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and so in creating a culture like that there and attracting the best, you know, the best talent like that, um, you can't help but see these, these types of things multiply out. And so as a natural result from that disparity increases, you know, so these big tech companies are just going to go so far out in terms of um, how far they grow and and there will be new ones that will disrupt disrupt them along the way no doubt but they are going to gain such a huge lead that um uh and i find it so i find it i find it so fascinating that not only have they got the tech bit they've now sorted out the culture bit in the sense of attracting this world-class talent now, yes, there is some cultural problems um, internally, as with big institutions. But the I find it so fascinating that they've really hit on uh, two of these elements here, and it, it allows. They also recognise the importance of doing these experimental projects, these very R and D orientated projects, these projects that don't have immediate payoff. Uh, looking, looking at like. Um, exploring ways in which we can get global internet. Now, whether you want that or not, um, they are pursuing it, obviously, with a long, long, long-term you know, vision of return. But if, in, until the years down the track when that comes, and this has been getting worked on for, I don't know, a decade or more for, for some of these companies, it's... Um, yeah, it takes it, – it, it seems so far out of the paradigm of, you know, seeking quarterly returns. <laughs> yeah, they've got a lot of profit to play with as well. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, there's not much – yeah, it's high leverage. So it's interesting to know where it's all going to go. It's it's kind of – the tech. it's an interesting kind of balance between like, okay – no one's going to catch Google, right? At being Google, so. But um, they may. They may. This is the other thing. Maybe, but we don't not know. Likely. We don't know what disruption holds, but the behaviour of Google 
is that they keep trying to push the frontiers themselves. And I think that keeps them at the frontiers. Uh, yeah, yeah, and attracting the best talent, as you say. But the other part of it is that, like, technology is a great leveler, this type of technology anyway, um, because it means that you and I can record this podcast right now. Um when 50 years ago it would have taken, you know, a full crew to do this um, and we would have had to, it would have, we have just been priced out, you know. It had the same high barriers to entry um, as like something like, um, you know, maybe in creating an airline now or something, you know. So there, there is a certain, you know, I suppose, leveling aspect to what the technology brings, but then the connectedness that it all brings as well tends to mean that it has these kind of winner-take-all power law um, kind of effects that then kind of pushed Google and those guys up, up, up. So how that will all play out, I do not know. So. I've got a I've got a a prediction here, mate, and I think there's the disparity disparity thing at play. But I'm really fascinated by so so Google's a, a big a big beast, right? And all these big big tech companies are a big beast, and it's like, well, are they undisruptible? Well, inherently within the beast of these companies is their culture and culture moves a lot slower uh, than uh, than the technology and certainly the the pace at which um, new things are emerging although arguably we're also in a great stagnation but things move fast in the in the space of technology or have the ability to move fast in the space of technology right so we're seeing a big a big upend of of more of the older institutions now with technology and so it's given rise to the, you know the consultants that do change management and digital transformation and all those those things that help these archaic organizations remove their paper <laughs> effectively and and start to do things you know from a te- technically orient technologically orientated point of view I wonder if there's a point in time at which technology is outpacing the pace at which we can implement change management of culture. Does that make sense? First of all, yeah. It will will the will the technology get so I guess uh, be changing so fast that our ability to then implement those changes to the really big companies. Um, kind of never keep up. Um, well, I think that the answer's probably is a perhaps a yes, but what I would say about that is that those parts aren't usually the strategic reasons that those companies are still exist anyway. Otherwise, they would already be out of business because they weren't didn't move quick enough from the paper to the other thing. So it depends on kind of what the technology is that's kind of um, brought to bear. Because if it does affect like the strategic pillar of BP, if the if um, we suddenly get these, there's a huge jump in the photovoltaic uh, capacity. Jeez, that's probably wrong, but you know what I mean. How good solar panels are, um, and all of a sudden batteries get so awesome that suddenly that affects the, you know, the strategic position of BP as being in oil. Then, then you start to see those kind of things get disrupted. Yeah, um, I do see. Yeah, I see what you're saying, right? I think I think the nature is though that the larger the larger an organization becomes the more 
the more kind of fixed the culture becomes. Now, it doesn't mean to say that the culture itself is a fixed and static culture like some of those, yeah, well, you're talking like people in the petrochemical industry. They're like, well, we've, we've found our, our gold source. We don't need to think about anything else now. Um, but well, there's still a, there's still, there's still a fixed culture. What you're saying here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but the way the way that um, the tech companies get around that is they just buy the other ones that are coming up, mm. um, and that's not a bad strategy. And at the start, Facebook did that, and they paid some big money for a few things, like WhatsApp and Instagram, and everyone, including me, thought they were a bit crazy. But they could. They understood the growth trajectory, the exponential nature, and the winner takes all effects that these these kind of systems have. So they knew they weren't really overpaying at that time. They were smart enough to kind of to see what others couldn't. So. Yeah. Well, and but yeah, which which can also lead to one of the the major flaws in those companies, mate, which is. Uh, they end up providing too much function or they end up providing this kind of blanket of function and it leaves room for for someone else to come in. I guess the point I'm getting at is um, at some point in time down the track, someone is going to be able to build a nuclear reactor in their backyard pretty easily and and yeah. or a – yeah, or, or build a, build a build a Facebook like a common. This would have been unheard of ten years ago, but now the the standard for uh, d- you know training software developers is like build a clone of this. So build a clone of Facebook, and so that that single full stack developer is able to achieve you know the core some of the core functionality that's provided in like the news feed and the friend connections and all this stuff with front end back end servers all these things are made possible through the democratization of technology and that's only going to continue so the the pace at which google's able to continue on their path of innovating at the frontiers they have to pick some frontiers they have to pick which paths they're going to pursue um they it's impossible to pick them all because there's an infinite number of paths (laughs) and so it leaves room for others to come in and i think with the technology that's able to be on you know that that's only going to get better it leaves room for smaller organizations with really nimble thinking and really deep problem solving skills enabled by this technology to come in and shake things up until they get acquired. That's that's a good summary of the discussion, I think, in this sort of last section. That's it, mate. Yeah. So have you got a closing quote for us? Oh, uh, sure. So within the overall structure of a project, there is always room for individuality and craftsmanship. 100 years from now, our engineering may seem as archaic as the techniques used by medieval cathedral builders seem to today's civil engineers. While our craftsmanship will still be honoured, so then, to bear in mind, this is a this is a follow on a little bit later on in the in the piece. We who cut mere stones must always be envisioning cathedrals. I thought that was quite fitting, mate, mm. for a for a couple of civil engineers. <laughs> That's nice. So, I think this book is well worth a read. If you read it, um, you'll probably learn one or two things that will vastly increase your productivity and output. That's it, mate. And as always, don't forget you can check out the video accompanying this audio on YouTube uh, and find our show notes on our website, abstractable.co. 
Thanks for listening. And if um, you did enjoy it, pass it on to someone else. We'd really appreciate it. Cheers.